Good afternoon, everyone. It is September 26, 2020. My name is Fassel. I'm the head equities analyst over at thealphatrades.com. Um, so I've been doing these videos for a while. You already know what the deal is. Uh, I'm just going to go over what happened throughout the week, what some of my moves were, and just how much uh, things have changed from last week to this week, because there was really a lot that happened um, from Monday when we had that huge sell-off to Friday when we closed extremely well. It was overall a very choppy week. One of the toughest weeks I've ever had to read personally as far as how the leadership was doing, uh, where the momentum was exactly going into, and um, also trying to mix in what was happening on the COVID front, on the unemployment front, how that was going to affect the markets, and, and ultimately whether or not it was actually going to affect the markets. Um, it was just a very tough week, and I think uh, ultimately it definitely proved me wrong first and foremost i think i came into this week expecting um at least a, a negative week and so far let me go ahead and just see how the market closed let's see how qqq closed for tech so tech was up tech was up 1.676 percent uh s p was flat and let's see, DIA down 1.74%. Actually, you know, I, I remembered I came into this week thinking that I could go either way. But um, if you guys had read my posts on, on Discord, I was pretty much leaning um, short heavy on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. And, and, you know, Thursday, I really felt like the market had come up to a point where it was about to see a really big sell off Friday. And, and ultimately, it just completely proved me wrong, blew past a lot of expectations. You had Shopify, which was struggling throughout the week, um, ended up closing very, very well. Uh, you know, it, it, as you can see right here, it, it, where was Monday, 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 let's see, I think this was Monday, and then it just kind of chopped around. And then here it actually made, closed at the, at the high of its week. Now it's not past, it's really tough resistance, but for the most part, it should have been brought down after everything that was going on. And, and the fact that you saw a lot of unity um, in terms of the momentum pertaining to the high growth space. So we could look at DocuSign uh, up four and a half percent. Also looked really good from its lows that it was making uh, Monday. It, it looks like it continues, it wants to continue to go up. MongoDB is another big one. Had a huge day uh, Friday. Let's go ahead and check out another one. Ro well, Roku was another one. I think it had it wasn't doing that well because most of the gains were made on Monday when it just popped back up. And and for those who have been keeping up with my trades, I actually was in a short. <laughs> I had actually gone into a short around here at one sixty nine point nine or something like one sixty nine point two, and it was doing really well. Uh, you know, I was making about 10, 15 points, and all of a sudden this this bounce comes up and completely takes out all my gains and. And at that point, I'm, I'm kind of on the fence. And for anyone who's been in those types of situations, it's really easy to panic and to get out. But ultimately, I, I ended up getting out on Friday for around a 7% loss, which I'm, I'm totally fine with. Look, I'm, I've been a hater on Roku. I, I've read the bull cases on it. I don't think that, you know, I, I get that they're, they're in a category. They're trying to create their own new category of, of specialized advertising, which is I guess very, very valuable to these advertisers, even though advertising spending is, is being cut back this year. Um, yeah, I'd, at, at a certain point, you just cannot fight the trend. And, and I think ultimately I, Roku will be beaten down, whether it's uh, by, by the exclusion of technology, whether TVs will, will come built into this type of distribution platform, which Roku basically is. It doesn't create its own content. It just distributes... Uh, multiple services like Netflix. You can watch Netflix on there and, and different uh, Amazon, d just different programs. It's, it's basically the middleman for all the content. And, you know, for, if, for me, if you're not making content, I really think you, you cannot bring people and keep people for the long run. So there's not that much longevity to it, but I've really read the bull case and, and, and I'm not going to disagree with it because I think it's a rare time, but I, I think the stock is ultimately very overvalued. Like I cannot believe that it's trading, you know, it still has negative 
earnings. It's going to make the wor- It's going to have its worst losses this year than it ever has since it's IPO'd, and yet the stock has made an all-time high. You know, there are different things that I'm like, doesn't make sense. But ultimately, if you're having, I think I read that gross margins are supposed to increase by 33% because of how they're shaping their their advertisements. Um, I'm sorry, their their data to advertisers. That's that's a very hard thing to go against. And ultimately, I don't think it's going to help them in the long run. I don't think they'll be able to keep that up because you have the likes of Apple TV, Amazon TV, um, all these other competitors that are coming in. Um, Google's been in there for a while and, and Roku's really staved them off. But you're going to have all these companies kind of come up with this same advertising model. And while Roku acts as if it's the only one that can do it, I don't think that they're going to be, I don't think that'll be the case. And I think you're going to see what's unique about them now um, really start to diminish, especially as more players come into, into the fold. And when you're going up against players that like Apple TV, Amazon TV, that have a lot of money to, um, to create content, push content and, and, you know, exclusively put out content through their services, not through Roku it really gives them a, a huge edge up in advantage. And, and if Roku was a, a 30, 40, $50 stock, I would say fine. It's, it's fine to take a risk because they've managed to, to stave off Google. And uh, with the, when Google came out with the Google stick, I thought that may be the end of Roku and, and they've survived it. So, you know, this, this company is, is resilient, but ultimately it's, it's getting the space itself is getting to be very crowded. And I think, the players that are coming in here are not the players you want to go up against. So, you know, I've, I may have been wrong on this one and I'll take the hit. I'll take the punch in the face, but uh, I, you know, that doesn't mean I'm not going to look to get back to shorting it at some point. It just, it may be above 200 or something. I don't know. We'll see. But uh, ultimately if I'm a long-term shareholder in, in Roku, I, I'm probably as long-term like for two to three years. That's how long-term I want to be max. I'm, this is not a 10 year play in my opinion. Maybe someone can buy this company out. But once again, when you don't have anything unique about you as far as content, it's tough for me to, to see that acquisition option. So anyways, I just, I just wanted to cover that. That was one of my bigger shorts and I had to end up covering it. And so, you know, it was sad, but it was indicative of, of how much I think the market has changed from the beginning of the week till now, because I was really short heavy and I'm still short heavy as far as shorting Tesla and, um, and Penn and silver and XLK and Delta. I'm still, you know, uh, entrenched in those, but I had to bring my short net short exposure down to around 45, 48% um, because the market had acted so well. And what's also different about last week to this week is I actually bought new stock for the first time in a month. Um, just based on everything that I had seen throughout the week, I was really impressed with the bulls. I was, I was so disappointed in the bears. You know, I was seeing all this data that there were so many people short. I was expecting some type of bigger movement. You know, I, I'm not expecting a huge collapse in the market at all. I don't, I think this market is a lot better than people give it credit for, um, despite it's disconnect to the real economy, but you know, the shorts didn't end up coming through and, and ultimately you have to in this market, I think this is my own opinion. You have to read what the market is telling you. You cannot be looking at the externals or, or the outer data. If things are not going your way, at some point you have to have this contingency plan to get out. And it has to be, it has to be somewhat fairly tight at this stage because volatility is so high. You could get whacked in a, in an instant. So I bought my first three stocks to, to, limit my um, pure net short exposure and, and raise my long exposure to around 20%. So I think, no, actually, I think like 23, 24%, I, I bought a, a good Facebook, a good amount of Facebook. But uh, the three stocks that I ended up buying was Facebook, Eli Lilly, and DHI. But I really didn't want to, to go too specifically in a certain area. And I also didn't want to go go out and buy some of the high growth stocks because I'm still unsure about their momentum. They're still trading at fairly high premiums. And I don't really know if, if you're going to see a continuation of a pullback or maybe a consolidation, but ultimately, ultimately because I saw such good things from, from the growth leaders Friday, I said to myself, I got to buy something that has 
a good amount of growth. And Facebook was the first one that, that came up to my mind. And, and I'll kind of go over it real quick why. Um, for everyone who knows what Facebook is, everyone knows what they do. Uh, Facebook, so 2020, they're growing 25%, and then they're also going 27% in 2021. So that's a really good um, growth rate, nice growth rate uh, increase. You know, it's, it's really tough to grow 25% year over year over year. And I think they've been doing that. They've, they've been doing that for at least four years. Maybe. No, that's not 20%. Maybe just, I guess, from 2019 to 2020. But so far, that growth rate is really nice. And what I really like to do is compare that growth rate with where the PE is. And so when you have somewhat of a low PE, but a high growth rate, that's really favorable to me, even if the PE is closer to the five-year range. In this instance, it's not, but in, in, in another stock that we'll get into, DHI, it is, but um, I'll kind of go over why I like that one later on. But, you know, Facebook was my quintessential pick for if you wanted to play growth, but also wanted to have safety. Not only was this stock meeting all the criteria from a technical perspective, but or I'm sorry, from a fundamental perspective, but technically it was already showing very nice signs. As you can see, it actually bottomed out right here where it, where it gapped up, which is a perfect, perfect uh, support level to, to come back from. And as you can see, you know, it, it's just now starting that, that Friday was a really nice day. And, you know, it could, it could still come back down, but at least you have an easy exit point. So if this stock ends up breaking below this gap for two days, that's the easy thing to say, okay, I'm out. Um, and I love stocks like that. I love when, when the contingency plan is easy to figure out because um, th those are when you can, those are the stocks that, that in my opinion have, I have the best success in, you know, if things don't go my way, I can cut losses fairly early on and, and move on. But ultimately I think this stock, as long as growth continues to power home and I, you saw from Shopify, you saw from DocuSign. What was another one that uh, did very well? Let's go ahead and check out Fastly. Fastly, I mean, Fastly, it looks like, hell, I wanted to short this stock, uh, I think last week when it was underneath here and damn, it kind of broke through very nicely after um, all the, the, the US banning stuff has cleared up and you know they, they bounced up really nicely, came back down. It looks like they're ready to go back up again. And, I'm not going to speak on valuation again because evaluation is, is like, I don't even know how to value things in this day and age. But once again, I just look at these stocks in terms of leadership. And if they're doing well, if, if investors are willing to buy into these names at these high premiums, that tells you a lot about the risk appetite for the market. And so far, the risk appetite is good. Um, I'm just going to touch on something real quick. Another thing that I like to look at in terms of risk appetite is how the small caps are doing. And the small caps have been a very lagging index. Um, you know, you, you could pretty much say that because they've been so lagging that their appetite for risk sentiment is, is low, but in fact, they've just been one of the worst hurt uh, businesses as a result of the COVID. So it's kind of a mixed bag. They also are, are really sensitive to low interest rates, so that should help them in the long run, but ultimately they've still lagged. Um, but this week, you know, they were one of the worst performers. And I think that that's very interesting because I actually saw some really good signs Friday. So Friday, they were up 1.62%. They'd actually crossed above some very key levels of mine. And I felt really good um, at the end of the day when I saw all my high growth leaders close well, and I saw this close well. So even though the Russell closed down over 4%, I actually don't think it was that bad of a, of a drop. And I think the initial selling came, what was it? Uh, was that Monday? Yeah, Monday was the big gap down. Monday, you, so Friday you had to close at 153.29. And then Monday it opened at, la, 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 come on, get there. Okay. Uh, Monday it opened at 150 and went all the way down to 146. So we're literally back at that price. We are literally back at that closing price on Monday. It had been a very choppy week, but ultimately I think it's that gap down really set the, the index on a different uh, foot. And ultimately the, just to see where it closed at, I think I was very, it, it was very positive in my opinion. And I think it reflects that high risk assets are, are still being bought. You know, so overall I felt compelled to buy Facebook and I did. Um, so let's move on to the next one. I got DHI. 
And the reason why I like DHI, as you can see, very good growth uh, this year, pretty good growth next year. And actually, you can't see it here, but the revenue growth looks, I think, is accelerating from 6% to 9%. Um, or no, I forgot. I think that's Eli Lilly. But uh, the revenue growth still looks fine. I did, There was nothing that I wrote down that was uh, that signaled any red flags or anything like that. But DHI and the entire housing sector have been one of the best sectors, stocks, whatever, to, to hold up in this market. As you can see, they're still way above their pre-COVID levels, which is rightfully so. If you've been keeping up with the housing numbers, they've been fantastic over the past uh, over the past two, three months as people have moved out of the highly dense cities and into the more suburban spaced out places. So housing demand is really, really high still. Now we're starting to hear issues about supply problems. So these guys are probably going to see even more business as they try to keep up with the demand. Um, and I think Friday, you actually saw lumber rise 7%, 6, 6 7%, or no, no, 5 to 6%. It was an insane, um, it was an insane rise, but I think it was indicative of the fact that there are just not enough homes. And so these companies, D.H. Horton, PHM is good, Lennar is good. Um, you know, all of them are going to see increased business over, over the next, at least the latter half, maybe the next year or two. I'm, I'm not an expert on this business. I don't know how the building cycles are, how much it takes to build or, or what the plans are. Um, but the bottom line is the, the industry forecasts look good as long as the, the demand stays high. And not only that, you're being accompanied by interest rates that are probably going to stay low for an extended period of time. So there's a lot of external factors that are helping push this sector higher, which is why I wanted to be in it. Um, I was in PHM earlier this year, it got out stupidly. Like, I think I was, I got in here, like around here. Uh, I think now right here and then got out like right here, <laughs> like 33%. I missed this whole move to the upside. Um, and that's, that's the sad part about being a trader. And, and if you're an investor, you're probably saying, I told you so. And exactly right. I just, I just didn't believe that the housing numbers would continue to go up because I thought the unemployment stuff would end up catching up to them, but that's not the case. And I, so far, if, if I'm starting to hear issues about supply problems, that's an even bigger issue. Um, or I'm sorry, that's an even bigger boon for, for this industry, at least for the next year or so. So overall things look good, uh, really good. The estimates kind of reflect that for now. The revenue growth looks really good. Um, and these stocks, as you can see, they're trading at, fairly low PEs relative to their relative to other sectors of the market. But what's very interesting is that the growth rates are extremely, you know, they're in the upper percentile actually of, of sectors. So you could see these stocks have a huge spike right here, but I would not be surprised if Pulte is a $60 stock by the, by, you know, February of next year, March of next year, or DHI is, um, you know, over a hundred by next year. That's just how good these stocks are. And, and once again, they're fairly priced. And for the amount of growth that they're giving you, it's, I don't know if you, you kind of saw that in 2017, 2018, that big jump. And that's when you had, um, you know, DHI go from 33 bucks to, to 51 bucks in a year. Um, you could see a similar move like that, where the stock could maybe go up 60 to 70% because that's how much the earnings are growing. I mean, they're growing 37% this year. So ultimately it's, it's looking really good for this sector. I think DHI above a hundred next year is not a, is not out of the ballpark, especially if there are supply issues and, and they're going to have to get to work even harder. So ultimately I like DHI. I wanted to be a part of the sector and there's a couple other names in, I mentioned PHM, Lennar. There's also Redfin, the, some of the newer age, uh, some of the newer age housing players, they're not directly home builders, but you know, they you can buy and sell houses on them and, and they are going along with that housing demand trend. They're definitely benefiting from that. So Redfin is, is an online marketplace where you can buy and sell a house. Same thing with Zillow. I think Zillow is the biggest one. And then true, I think truly, uh, I forgot what the symbol was. It's truly, a um, maybe someone bought out truly. I can't remember long i cannot remember what happened to trulia but trulia is also another one um but once again zillow as you can see 
all time highs spiked like crazy. I know we had uh, one member in our community, oh, Hui, I think uh, that had been talking about Zillow for such a long time. Um, I think when it was around 60 bucks actually. Um, and uh, it's just been a fantastic, fantastic trade. And I never really thought that this stock would go the way it did because I mean, they're still losing money. The, the revenue is, is very good, but ultimately if you're still losing money at this stage, I'm kind of going to stay away from you. Um, but it's worked out very well. And you know, they can continue to, to benefit from this increased demand. I do want to see more earnings growth. Hopefully the estimates are still just a little bit low, but I want to see profitability come up at least in 2021, maybe 2022, just based on how good the, uh, the housing, the housing data is coming out. So that's something to pay attention to. I don't know if I would buy Zillow here. I think it's, it's fairly expensive, but once again, like what are you going to do with valuation? I don't, I really don't know how to read valuation anymore. And, and so I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not going to say don't buy it because it's expensive, but ultimately I'm going to try and find other players that are, that are cheaper. And I think DHI, PHM, the home builders um, are definitely the, the safer bet to go, but that doesn't mean that Zillow is not going to go up because the reason why I bought DHI and, and why I'm saying I like PHM and them is because um, a lot of the technical trends as well as the the housing data that's coming out, it's all indicative of the of the sector going higher. So, I may have put out the alert for DHI on Friday, but I also said PHM, Lennar, Redfin. You know, all these guys are good to to play from here uh, because of how unified the the trends look. So, I think housing will have a great month. You know, at two weeks a month, technically, I think they can go up maybe 10, 11, 12 percent over the next month. So that's definitely a sector to watch out for. I'm, I'm very positive on, I, on ITB and housing in general. So DHI was my top pick, but uh, you know the other ones are totally fine. And lastly, the last one I wanna get to is Eli Lilly. So I've been in the stock a couple of times throughout the year. One of my favorite uh, pharmaceutical companies, not, not I'm, I'm not saying favorite because I like the company. Like I think they're kind of an evil company, but uh, I kind of keep business and, and, and ethics separate when I'm, when I'm trading stocks. So, you know, Eli Lilly is one that I'll never be a long-term holder and I don't feel comfortable being a, a firm believer in the stock, but I would love to trade it because it gives you some of the best growth in the industry. Um, you know, I, as you can see, just from the from the technical from the technical levels, it's really bounced back from this key level. So this is where it sold off in uh, March of 2020. Uh, I believe this is the 200 day. Kind of came down here, bounced, blah blah blah, found support, went back up, and now it's come back at such a nice pace because you see how it bottomed out, made this made this bottom right here. It came down or it went back up, and then came down to that exact same level. But at the same time, you're seeing it meet that that key support level. And so ultimately, I think the stock is still very, fairly undervalued, even though once again, you see um, the PE closer to the five-year range, the five-year high, I'm sorry. The growth is substantial, 21% uh, this year and then 10% next year. That drop-off is fine because revenue is expected to increase. I think it's going up 6% this year and 9% next year. So you're seeing that revenue growth rate accelerate even as the earnings growth rate decreases, which is it offsets in my book. It's not like, in, I'm not using a model or anything. I'm just kind of um, saying in general, I, I think that's fine. Um, because I mean, they're still growing double digits. It's not totally bad. And, and when you have a revenue growth rate that's accelerating by 50%, that's, that's more than fine for me. Um, the only thing that, that may worry you and, and some people is that they have a huge amount of debt. But this company is very interesting because they are very knowledgeable about what's going on in their industry. Um, I'm not very high on drugs and, and uh, just pills in, in general for, for the next 10 years. I don't think that people will be on as many drugs as they are now because of how genomics and, and other technologies are going to play out over the next 10 years. I think the, the data and, and all the, the stuff that's coming out of the genomic side is is actually very bad for drug makers. And I think they realize that, which is why companies like Pfizer have been making big acquisitions in, in the biotech space. 
um, I forgot who they bought a huge, a huge biotech. Was it Celgene? I think it was Celgene. But um, uh, let me get back to Eli Lilly. Eli Lilly is also on that path where they understand exactly what's going on in the industry. And their debt has skyrocketed as a result of them making an acquisition every single quarter. That's their goal. They have said that we want to make an acquisition at least once every quarter because that's where they're getting their growth from. Um, they have a stable pipeline of drugs relating to the, um, you know, relating to, to issues from arthritis, diabetes and stuff, but they understand that the future is in another area. And that's why a lot of these companies are buying, you know, biotech names. Sometimes they're working with the genomics names, um, but Eli Lilly, I think, has one of the more aggressive stances in that they want to purchase at least one company every quarter. So I like this company. I'm not too afraid of the debt. I think that their cash flow generation could be a little bit better. Um, but ultimately, I'm not an expert in, in drugs or anything like that. So I'm still in a wait and see thing. I want to see how the next quarter does, what, how the, the cash comes through, um, you know, what their acquisitions are leading to is it starting to come to fruition or is it you know are they just kind of building a ton of debt and losing a, a, a ton of cash and it's not really amounting to anything at this point i'm still willing to give this company a break because of how it's set up technically and just um you know compared to the other stocks in the sector we could look at johnson johnson another leader johnson johnson has been consolidating for a long time um eli lilly once again, you could see a clear uptrend just like that. We can go ahead and check out Bristol Myers. Looks a lot uglier, even though the estimates and everything look a lot better. Um, I think it's because uh, they're more based in generic drugs, and generic drugs are are kind of an iffy thing right now. But you know, the estimates still don't reflect that. The estimates still show that this stock is cheap, trading at a 10 PE. Um, I've been in this name a couple times this year, primarily for that reason because I thought it was cheap, and and it hasn't always panned out um, the way I wanted it to. So once again, I think the best way to play this sector uh, is through playing the ones that are outperforming the most. I think MRK is, is also my second favorite. AbV, I think, is still the best one um, as far as a mix of fundamental of fundamentals and technicals. Uh, the, their Allergan acquisition, I think, is, is fantastic. And it's changing the company. I think the company is still going through this phase where it's, it's getting out the old and, and trying to pump in the new and, and get become a, a very integrated with Allergan to where Allergan starts making the majority of its, of its uh, profit. But that stock is still, you know, just kind of chopping around. I'm, I'm still in it. I was in it for at around, uh, was it 94 or something like that? I will probably end up buying more this week if I see the sector and, and everything else turn out good. But ultimately, because I I wanted to get some gains and really balance out my my short exposure, I thought Eli Lilly, because it held up the, the best technically, that was a play to go. Um, and as well, the, the estimates look great. The fundamentals look great. And I, you know, this stock has been on my list for a while. So I had no problem going into this one, even though I have uh, AbV as well. And so that was just my overview of, of the three picks that I made Friday. Uh, I had been, for the most part, like I, at some point this week, I was like 60. I literally, I think in the morning of Friday, I was 65% short. Um, and uh, ultimately, as the day went on, I just could not believe what I, what I was seeing from the leaders. NVIDIA was the main one that was, that was telling me this market was going higher right from the beginning. Um, the market had opened down, I believe, and it was making this sort of consolidated pattern. Let me go ahead and check, check this out real quick. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, right here. Move. Get the hell out of here. All right. So the market had gapped down. Oh, no, no, that's not it. Uh, where is it? I think the market had gapped down right here, and I guess you can't see it well. Let me see on one minute chart. Can't even go back on this one. Okay, whatever. Let's see if I can undo this. Okay, that's fine. So the market gap down right here, and you may not be able to see it clearly. I wish I could pull up my other charts, but some issues with that. Um, you know, it, it had kind of consolidated for here, for here, for here, and then at around 
10.50, it broke out of that consolidated range. And at that point, it just started going up, 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 up like crazy. And so let's go ahead and take a look at that. So 10, what's that, 10.25, 10.50, okay, 10.30. All right. So let's go ahead and check out NVIDIA real quick. These are just some of the small things that I use. So NVIDIA was one that also, it opened up, surprisingly, despite the market opening down, sold off with the market, but as the market was chopping up and consolidated, this stock was actually, you know, testing its high. And by the time it, the market had broken up a little bit, this had also broken up above its, its consolidated base too. Now it still had some more room to go as far as breaking above this key level that had sold off before yesterday. But once again, when it needed to the most, the buyer stepped in in a huge way and took the stock up, you know, almost 1%, four points, all the way above there. And from then on, the stock just kept powering up along with the, uh, the market. So NVIDIA was the main one that I was watching that, that told me, hey, I got to get in this market. I got to reduce my short exposure. Um, that was the one stock that if you guys have been listening to me, that's the one I've been saying, keep your closest eye on. When they start to buy this stock, that's when you want to buy the market. So I got that, uh, I got that signal and, and ultimately I, I bought those three stocks. So going into next week, I expect NVIDIA to once again lead this market. Amazon was doing okay it, it actually didn't close as well as i wanted it to but as long as it closed above 30 um 3083 i believe that was fine and it closed above 3095 which is fantastic so amazon once again is is one you also got to watch nvidia microsoft was also showing me something in the pre-market friday um despite most of the indexes opening down microsoft is also a one that i'm keeping an eye on but as i mentioned in my last video i'm not really that that positive on Microsoft because I think Sony's come up for their heads for the PS5 and, and Microsoft has put so much into their gaming that uh, like if they don't sell enough Xbox, I don't even know what the new Xbox is called. Uh, the, if they don't sell enough of the new Xbox, I think that that will really shake up their entire ecosystem and they're going to have to start cutting back substantially. Um, so it's, it's going to be something to watch. I think this, this company was, largely propped up somewhat because of how much they were into gaming and gaming was a big segment in being a Corona advantage sector. Um, you know, you saw stocks like ATVI, take two do fantastic EA. Um, but if, if Microsoft loses that gaming component, that's a really big component. And, and I'm not saying the stock's going to go all the way back down to, to one thirty or sell off 10, 15, 20%, but uh, it could definitely be, be a selling point come next, next earnings quarter and, and you could see this company report great cloud revenues great um, uh, you know across the board great cybersecurity revenue all this, this stuff but if they get whacked on gaming I think that could be something that could keep this stock from outperforming as it has over the past year or two years um, so once again look at those three stocks to lead the market this week I expect a good week um, but ultimately I still think this market is not going to go up to its high. I don't think it's going to break above its high. I think it, it could go somewhere between, um, like I think this level right here, where we kind of you know stopped out a little bit before a couple of weeks ago before selling down. I think that's going to be the level of, of uh, contention right there. So 342 and a half for that SPY is a, a level you should watch. But I think the market is, is smooth sailing until then. I think we're going to see gains come come right up until we hit that level on you know, if the gains are for real, we should probably break that level fairly easily. So those are just some of the things I'm keeping an eye out on. Um, for future picks, I got to, uh, like, I, I think I'm still uncertain about whether or not I want to buy high growth. But if I did want to buy high growth, I think the two that look very interesting to me, Dynatech got an upgrade Friday. It was a big five and a half percent. This company is really interesting. And I, I think you guys should do some some work on or some homework on this company and see if you like it. Uh, it's in the automated, the automated, um, not automated sector. Um, they're in the automated, uh, I don't even know how to, how to explain it right now, but they're just a company that specializes in automated software. There we go. And uh, it's definitely one that, that you guys should keep an eye out on. I 
just recently discovered this company. I, I went on their website, was Googling all their products and stuff like that. So I'm still learning about it. But from what I've seen, it's, it's a really interesting company. And I, I want to see more use cases out of it. I'm, I'm going to do some more work on it. But Dynatrace is one that piqued my eye because it, it has that earning safety. It's growing 60, 60, I'm sorry, 60% in 2021. And, you know, from 13 to 30%, that's almost a, a hundred percent. That's more than a hundred percent gain for this year. So this company is, is growing fairly fast and you have their earnings. They're, they're profitable. You have that floor compared to the other growth stocks. So this one that, that I could definitely see going to 50 yeah, fairly soon. I think the, the upgrade that it got Friday said something about that, that the target was 50, but Dynatrace is one. And then let me check out Zoom. Oh no, Zoom is, is good. <laughs> Zoom, I, I can't touch right now. Um, that was another one that was good. Um, it was in the cybersecurity space. I think it was Fortinet. Yeah, Fortinet was one that that's it struggled a little bit. I don't know why it struggled compared to the sector, but the estimates still look fine. It has no debt. Um, it has a stable earnings floor, uh, very profitable, growing growing very nicely. So that's one. If, if I do feel like I want to play high growth, I think this is another safe one to play. But once again, I don't think it's as safe as Facebook, but you know, you, you can get a lot more volatility from, from a stock like Fortinet than Facebook uh, most of the time. So Fortinet would be one, Dynatrace would be another one. And then lastly, AYX was one that I was in when the market first pulled back, or I'm sorry, when the stock first pulled back, I think it got in at around 106 and sold out at around 112 or 114, something like that. And this company is, is one of the values of the high growth space. And I say value very loosely because it's 133 PE, but uh, ultimately it has profitability. It is making uh, positive earnings. Uh, it has a good amount of debt, but the, the cash flow was very good from what I remember. So the debt really didn't bother me that much. Um, but once again, this stock seems to be holding a, a good base. It could come down to, to 92 bucks or something like that, but I really don't think that investors are going to let this stock break below a hundred. So if this is a, uh, if I start to see a lot of momentum in terms of, of high growth, once again, breaking above my short-term resistance levels and stuff like that, I think AYX is, is a company that I still think it's a, it's a takeover target. Um, you know, they got solid earnings floor. They're, Fairly expensive, but when you look at expensive compared to the other growth stocks that are growing, you know, obviously it's it's seeing decline of 54%, but next year it's 121 or 112%, which is um, a little bit in line with what they were doing in 2019. I think that uh, this company could be well be back close to its highs, maybe around 160 um, in no time. So this is another name that I'm keeping an eye out on. Um, those are three names, Dynatrace, Fortinet, and AYX. If I did want to play high growth, that's the, those are the stocks that I would do it in. But ultimately, that's, that's the end of my spiel. Um, just to wrap everything up, in case I was ranting a little bit too long, um, my three buys that I would pick now that are safe would be Eli Lilly, DHI, and Facebook. If, high, if you're feeling in, in the more risky mood, the high growth mood, I think Fortinet, AYX, and Dynatrace are all three companies you should do some research on. And then um, for the market outlook for the week, I think it's, it's fairly positive. I think this, this should be a smooth week. And um, ultimately, if you're still short like I am, this would be a good time to add some longs because I don't think we're out of the woods in terms of the market um, selling off again. We, we could still be in some type of big correction that's, that's taking a long time to play out. But um, for the short term, you, you kind of have to just play the upside, at least for this week. And, and I'll reassess next week where, where all the leaders are at and where the market's at and everything like that, whether or not we get to that, that key S&P level. But uh, yeah, I think it's, you, you kind of have to play this week to the upside. And, and with the volatility, where volatility is at, you could get some nice gains within a week. So I'm probably going to be buying a additional stocks Monday. I don't know what yet. I, I think I'll let the market tell me what it wants to do. But uh, yeah, that's my main 
forecast for the week and uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you don't know who we are, if you haven't seen my discord, I, I update it daily. Um, you know, for all my discord users who, who are listening to me right now, you guys already know that I've been talking about this and you guys already know about the Facebook Eli Lilly stuff. Um, but for those who don't know, go ahead and check us out at thealphatrades.com. Check out our premium discord channel. That's where I post everything. Um, as far as stock alerts, uh, stock updates. I usually tell tell y'all exactly what is going on in the morning around 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock so that you can position yourself for the day. And, and then I'll usually make an um, aftermarket update uh, to kind of wrap everything up what happened throughout the day. So if you want more information on that, if you, if you like my spiel a little bit, go ahead and check that out. Um, but other than that, hope you guys take care. Have a great Saturday afternoon, night, great weekend. And I'll see y'all Friday, next Friday. I think I'm going to start doing these videos Friday. But anyways, take care. Have a good one.